Welcome to Family Bible Time. We are in 2 Chronicles 5 and 6. We're not doing all of chapter 6, we're just doing the first 11 verses. And, and then we're in 1 John 4. So 2 Chronicles 5 and 6 and 1, Chronic and 1 John 4. Let's pray and let's go. Lord, thank you for another day. Thank you for... Uh, bring us safely home after a, a wonderful day at church. We pray that you'd bless now your word to our our souls. Please speak to us. Please change us through your word. In Jesus' name, mm. amen. Amen. All right, 2 Chronicles 5. That's all the works of so that Solomon did for the house of the Lord. That's all the work that Solomon did for the house of the Lord was finished. And Solomon brought in the things that David his father had dedicated and stored, the silver, the gold, and all the vessels, and the treasuries of the house of God. Then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the leaders of the father's houses, of the people of Israel in Jerusalem, to bring up the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, which is Zion, and all the men of Israel assembled before the king at the feast, that is, in the seventh month. And all the elders of Israel came, and the Levites took up the ark. And they brought up the ark, the tent of meeting, and all the holy vessels that were in the tent. The Levitical priests brought them up. And King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel who had assembled before him were before the ark, sacrificing so many sheep and oxen that they could not be counted or numbered. Then the priests brought the ark of the covenant of the Lord to its place in the inner sanctuary of the house, in the most holy place, underneath the wings of the cherubim. The cherubim spread out their wings over the place of the ark, so that the cherubim made a covering above the ark and its poles. And the poles were so long that the ends of the poles were seen from the holy place before the inner sanctuary, but they could not be seen from outside. And they are there to this day. There was nothing in the ark except the two tablets that Moses put there at Horeb, which the Lord made a covenant with the people of Israel. But where the Lord made a, made a covenant with the people of Israel, you know where that is, Horeb is Mount Sinai, isn't it? Um, when they came out of Egypt, verse 11. And when the priests came out of the holy place, for all the priests who were present had consecrated themselves without regard to their divisions, and all the Levitical singers, Asaph, Heman, and Jeduthun, their sons and their kinsmen, arrayed in fine linen with cymbals, harps, and lyres, stood east of the altar with 120 priests who were trumpeters, and it was the duty of the trumpeters and singers to make themselves heard in unison, in praise and thanksgiving to the Lord. And when the song was raised with trumpets and cymbals and other instruments, musical instruments in praise to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever, the house, the house of the Lord, was filled with a cloud so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. Mm. Now there's your proof positive. You remember what that man said to us about the tabernacle being the place that God had designed and the temple being the creation of man. Mm. Well, that's not right, is it? The glory of the Lord filled the temple as well. And we saw, didn't we, that David had received his plans from God. Mm. And so you can't do that to the mm. Bible. You've got to read the whole thing. Then, verse 1, chapter 6, Then Solomon said, The Lord had said that he would dwell in thick darkness. But I have built you an exalted house, a place for you to dwell in forever. Then the king turned around and blessed all the assembly of Israel, while the assembly of Israel stood and he said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who with his hand has fulfilled what he promised with his mouth to David, my father, saying, Since the day that I brought my people out of the land of Egypt, I chose no city in all of the tribes of Israel in which to build a house, that my name might be there. 
and I chose no man as prince over my people Israel, but I have chosen Jerusalem, that my name may be there. And I have chosen David to be over my people Israel. Now it was in the heart of David my father to build a house for the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. But the Lord said to David my father, Where is it? Whereas it is in it was in your heart to build a house for my name, you did well that it was in your heart. Nevertheless, it is not you who shall build the house, but your son who shall be born to you shall build the house for my name. Now the Lord has fulfilled the, his promise that he made. For I have risen in the place of David my father and sit on the throne of Israel as the Lord promised. And I have built the house for the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. And there I have set the ark in which is the covenant of the Lord that he made with the people of Israel. And I guess you could ask, well, what happened to Aaron's staff that budded? And what happened to the manna mm. and stuff like that? And the answer is, well, we don't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we don't know. Sorry, can't tell you that one. Okay. Now, um little thing about the glory of the Lord filling the house. I've heard sermons on this and I've heard it referenced a number of times just by people who kind of get all magical, mystical about it and, mm. and say, you know, this is, it's almost like this is an example for us of, of what we should have. Well, um... There are people in the church today who think that there's a glory cloud in their church when they worship, and they fake it. Um, there was something here that was real about the visible presence of God with his people, wasn't there? So they could, they could know God is with us. It's pretty cool, isn't it? We get to know that God is with us, not because of a cloud or a visible presence, but we get to know God is with us because of the presence of his Holy Spirit among his people. And, and grace and glory rests upon us if we are filled with the Spirit. And, and so we can say, look, we... We're not short of the possibility to have God's presence with us obvious today. We're just, we're just short of the reality of it. So we, we don't get this, but it is possible when God is really among his people blessing them, it's possible to see that. And I'm not talking visibly, I'm talking metaphorically. You can just see that. Wow, God is with this group of people. Mm. And and what obviously dampens that, what what ruins that is then our sin. Very interesting book on that front is the um I was about to say Mansoul, what's it called? Um by John Bunyan. Holy War. Holy War, that's right. Holy War by John Bunyan is very interesting insight into this whole reality of us grieving the Holy Spirit by our sin. But Jesus said, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. So we, we won't lack the presence of God, but we can lack his presence to bless us, His presence, the power of his presence. Um helping us and enabling us and you know when when the new testament church knew the powerful presence of god with them they were filled with boldness and they were witnessing powerfully to people and the church was multiplying and, and, and so i would say look where we lack that we should look to our sin we should look to ourselves because Jesus' promise holds true. But I don't think we should look for a mystical, magical cloud. Mm. And we certainly shouldn't be taken in by charlatans who drop tinsel from the ceiling. Not tinsel. What did they drop? It's kind of like 
Angel dust. Angel dust. 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 Angel feathers, I think. Some of them had angel feathers falling from the ceiling. Someone's up there with a bag of feathers when people are doing that. All right. 1 John 4. Beloved, do not believe every spirit. That's kind of what I'm saying. But test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. Uh, and that's worth just thinking about. He doesn't say there's a few false prophets. There are many false prophets. Mm. It's very easy to be taken in. It's very easy to encounter a false prophet. Just because there's lots of them. So watch out. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses Jesus, that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, is from God. This is the first mark of genuineness, which, I mean, I'm reading my own notes in my Bible here. I think these came from MacArthur. The first mark is esteem for the real Jesus. Esteem for the real Jesus. This is how you, by, by this you know that the Spirit of God, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you've heard was coming and is now in the world already. Okay, so if there's no esteem, regard, recognition, acknowledgement, love for the real Jesus, it's not the real spirit of God. Okay, Mark 2 Verse 4, little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. So Mark 2 is a move toward rejecting the world. This is talking about holiness, isn't it? This is saying, you're from God and you've overcome them because he who's in you is greater than he who's in the world. They're from the world, therefore they speak from the world and the world listens to them. But you're, you're not going in the same direction. So you want to know if you're genuine if you don't know if someone's someone's genuine, they're rejecting the world. They're not embracing the world. When in verse five it says they are from the world, therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. When the world is listening to somebody, that's a bad sign. If you get invited onto Oprah Winfrey, <laughs> do you even know who Oprah Winfrey is? Winfrey is no. You don't, it's a need-to-know basis, and you don't need to know. <laughs> but if you get invited onto the Oprah Winfrey show, she's a, she's a woman who just says whatever seems right to her and calls it her truth. And, you know, it's sort of a... She's a, a, a host of a TV show called, with her name, and she just basically talks a load of nonsense all the time. But sometimes she'll invite preachers on, but she'll only invite preachers who are spouting that kind of nonsense. Look, if the world loves what a preacher is saying, it's a bad sign. Mm -hmm. Verse 6, we are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So mark three in this list of four marks is increasing regard for scripture. Whoever knows God listens to us. And mark four is the fact that it leads, that is leading into the truth. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So the, the we are from God, whoever, list, whoever knows God listens to us. Obviously, John was an apostle. Um, he's writing scripture. Um, 
he's saying, look, I, I'm telling the truth. I, I'm, I'm speaking from God. So if anyone genuinely knows God, they're going to be listening to us. Mm. Jesus said something similar, didn't he? If you meet someone and they're, they're not listening to Scripture, they don't really trust the Bible, and the more they read of it, the more they distrust it, rather than the other way around, you know that they're not from God. Mm. But someone who knows God listens to Scripture. That's why the best way you can help people is just by sharing the truth with them. Uh, and this listening to listening to the truth, by this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Well, this helps you then to um, be able to discern truth. So this knowledge leads into the truth. Right, that was Mark 4. Mark 5, verse 7. Mark 5 is love. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. It's interesting, isn't it? He says, let us do this. But then he says, love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. So we, we, it's both automatic, but also it's necessary for us to be encouraged to do this. Mm. Verse 8, anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the Hmm, there's our wonderful word. Propitiation mm. for our sins. What is propitiation? The sacrifice that takes away wrath. Yeah. All right, next time I ask you what propitiation is, <laughs> I want you to be able to say it just like that. What's propitiation? The sacrifice that takes away wrath, okay? Are you going to be able to remember that? Because we keep saying it, but you've just got to store it away in your head. Propitiation, the sacrifice that takes away wrath. Verse 11, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him, and he in us, because he has given us of his Spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to the world to be the Saviour of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God abides in him, and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. There's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears is not, has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he, does not love his, for he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he's not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God, must also love his brother. Mm. And so Mark 5 is love. You're abiding in love and you're, you've got this confidence for the day of judgment. Not because you're looking at yourself and saying, oh look how well I've done, God's going to look at me and say, well done, you've done really well, I'll let you into heaven. But when you look at yourself, if you're living in love towards other Christians, you know that this is something God has done. Mm. This is from God. Love is from God. And God has worked this love in me. And, and therefore, it is real. God has saved me. I am different. Mm. I have been changed. So we have confidence for the day of judgment. That's really 
part of assurance, isn't it? So mm. this is really helpful. Oh, sorry. They weren't John MacArthur's. They were Jonathan Edwards' distinguishing marks. <laughs> there we are. Um, well, that's me done for today. <laughs> I'm officially cooked. Uh, now I'm ready to be put to rest <laughs> like a cake. <laughs> Let's pray. Thank you for today, Lord. Thank you for giving us the strength that we need. I pray that you bless us now and help us to to um, be able to rest and to serve you tomorrow, Lord. Thank you for bringing us through another week. We pray for your blessing on the week ahead now. For Jesus' sake, amen. amen. All right, good night. God bless you. We'll see you tomorrow, if the Lord wills and we live and I can wake up. Mm -hmm.